ultimately within a team you want kind of this very hyper motivated people in there um, who, who push you further and they they give you kind of a wake up call if you're already more experienced and it's like yeah actually look at this person is really happy even though nothing everything looks wrong maybe but this this inspiration this motivation is very very much helping myself as well to keep going push further to be better my guest today is christopher Hees, who is a supervisor lead and engineer working for double negative and the foundry chris was my lighting supervisor on the heinzels animation feature film and i could experience his team management style in person together we talk about building a successful and healthy team in a stressful film production handling team dynamics and how to give feedback and do reviews without negative emotions. You are listening to The 21 Artist Show, a podcast that inspires creatives to make meaningful content to pursue their passions. I'm talking with creators, artists and engineers about their careers, lessons they have learned and how to make an impact. I'm your host Alexander Richter. I'm a technical director and coach in visual effects, animation and games. For more content, go to 21artistshow.com. Enjoy the show. It's awesome to have you on the show, Chris. Thank you. Happy to be here. Before we go into the topic itself, I would like to get a little bit of like your background. I mean, we know each other, but also for the audience and people who are listening, it would be interesting to get a little bit of a glimpse into your career and uh, where you are now, basically. I will start on my very first um, serious paid job, um, not at the very beginning. So my first job was basically um, in the, within the games industry, actually, uh, working on AAA games in Vienna um, as a generalist. So doing various tasks such as modeling, texturing, animation, yeah, so multiple different things. Uh, unfortunately, after around one and a half years, approximately, yeah, the company um, shut down and we were all let go so at that time i was then thinking okay what what should i do next and i always wanted to actually work within the movie film industry so i thought this is now a perfect um the perfect time right so i basically packed my stuff and moved to england uh, and started studying again at the bottom of university for one year um doing the master's de degree in digital effects um that like I was hoping that that allows me easier to get a job within the industry as it is really sp specialized in that area. So after this one year at the university, I was then looking for a job in London. Um, and that was actually really difficult because I don't know if, if you remember it or if you know it, um, but at the time, um, the, the production of John Carter from Mars finished. and and the majority of the visual effects houses within London hired a huge amount of artists from all around the world um, for that movie because it's it's very, very visual effects heavy, right? So once that finished, um, the, let's say there was a huge amount of unemployed, um, experienced artists out there. And then as a fresh graduate, um, to get a job um, was kind of almost impossible. It's like it, it, it was really, really difficult. So as an alternative, then I got actually the opportunity to work for the Foundry um, as a QA engineer uh, within the Mari team. So that was a very interesting experience. So I really liked it, um, but it was not really what I actually wanted to do. So after around, again, after around one and a half years, um, I tried to get back into the movie industry. And at that time, then I was lucky enough that I actually got a job um, at Double Negative. So there I started as an FX TD and yeah, worked basically on various movies such as Fantastic Beasts, Dunkirk, um, Hunger Games, Captain America, and so on. So I, I really remember very well my first movie, which was Hunger Games, Catching Fire. First of all, I was super nervous <laughs> um, joining the industry. And then, and then once you sit in your room and you get assigned your shots and you kind of meet the people we are working with um it's actually very intimidating to be honest at least it was for me um you have all these amazing people sitting around you and now you, you you're kind of in the middle between them and you should do kind of reach the same quality as, as or the same quality of work of what they do so so that's very intimidating so it took me quite a while actually to feel 
comfortable and also confident in in the tasks I'm doing. I spent um, three and a half years at Double Negative as an FX TD, and after that, I kind of wanted a change of pace, so I moved back to Austria, Vienna, and and started working at Arx Anima, um, where I spent now the last four and a half years. But yeah, so here I changed. Actually, I didn't do effects anymore. I changed to lighting, and then worked as a lighting artist, lighting lead, and in the end. Um, on the last project actually was working as a CG supervisor on a feature animated movie. So basically that's, that's kind of the, the history of my past, let's say 10 years, 10 to, to 12, 13 years, um, working from games to visual effects or from games to software development, to visual effects, to animation as a, <laughs> yeah, generalist engineer, um, effects CD and in the end lighting and then, and then supervisor. So. A varied variety of, of different tasks and positions. Yeah, the last part was actually where we both met. We were at Arx Anima. We were both working on, on Heinzels. You were my, my lighting supervisor. And uh, that's also one of the reasons I kind of like, we, we I, I really enjoyed working with you. And I enjoyed also a big part of it was the way how you supervised uh, and the way how you kind of facilitated the team. I think that was something. I really like, I mean, this is like a little bit of a combination in a lot of sense, but um, especially uh, from your point, uh, I always felt also you had this one level more, you know, not just like I'm a good supervisor and I treat my team well. I always felt like that you kind of also have this building part in, in that too, this kind of that you think like ahead or before and always try to figure out like is this is this person good for the team not just technically not just like in terms of skill and so that's one of the things i i really enjoyed and that brings us basically to today's episode because i, I wanted to talk with you about building like a, a productive and a healthy team uh, a little bit from the start also and a little bit from both angles i think it's it's important to to talk about from the angle of the like supervisor, from the one who is building the team, um, whoever this is, could be a lead, could be a supervisor, could be maybe even producer or whatever. Um, and also from the angle of being part in the team, because I feel like you need both parts to push ahead. You know, it's like with each, each situation, you cannot just rely that the leader will provide for everything and will make like everything happen. At the end of the day, it's also about the like everyone in the team who who provides the, the heart and the soul and sometimes the work to, to keep the team in balance and healthy and stuff like that. So I feel like this is something I, I would, uh, would like to kind of explore with you today. I think we should start there at the beginning. And uh, so I think recruiting is probably the beginning. It doesn't mean sometimes you you're, you not have the chance. Sometimes you have a, like already an established team from a different project or something like that. But we, we go like through all the kind of stages and let's let's begin with something where we have the choice of more or less who we can pick for our team. So I would say you would start with recruiting. So what would be like the first step when we would build a team with recruiting? Yes, so recruitment is definitely a good um, starting point of how you want to create your team. Um, but before we go into more detail about that, I would like to give you a bit of a background of why I think building a team is, a, is an important topic. So over the years, I worked for various different companies and each of them had their own ways and approaches of how um, they want to create a team, how they want to build a team, how to keep the employees kind of comfortable and satisfied in at the workplace and in the work they're doing, right? So some of them I found really, really good and some of them I didn't like so much. Anyway, so why do I think um, it, building a team is, a, is an important topic and should be for any, any production? So, so basically what you want is a team that can fulfill any given task in a good and efficient way, right? And here it's not only um the the individual skill of each team member that is accountable for the success of the project or of the task right so at least that's what i think so in the end for example um you have a person which is which gets hired for a specific task because it's exceptionally good in this task and you know okay that that person that artist can do that job very good um so you put it in this position um and and add them to the team, right? 
But let's say this person doesn't really connect with the team or doesn't feel integrated or the team itself is not really a team and everyone works for themselves. Um, so you're never sure, OK, who can you ask? So what what are you allowed to do in a way, how to work? Um, you kind of are not sure who is your person of contact in a way or you're not sure what is your responsibilities and and kind of you don't feel fully integrated um so you kind of feel limited uh, not just from from a task based approach but also like in a mental way um if i can say that so in this case most likely this person will not meet the expectations you actually originally had to this artist right so how come and this is why i think building a team and trying to connect them is a very important topic that should be taken seriously. Everyone should feel free uh, to work in their own environment in, in terms of like, you know, that you don't have to, to make sure all the time, you know, to make sure that what you do is okay. You have to kind of check, for example, with you all the time. Is that okay? Is that okay? Is that okay? Which also takes a lot of time from you and it takes a lot of responsibility from each of the artists because they become like slaves to to the progress it's become like okay i'm i i think that's what what like because they they start to think the supervisor is the one who decides everything and then and then it becomes kind of like uh, i have to please the supervisor instead of i have to please the like the project or something like that so i think that's that, that's a little bit of the focus but like quick question before we go into the recruiting from compared like dnec and foundry which one uh, you felt you felt the most inspired from from like um, the team aspect? To be honest, both had actually very, very good approaches um, towards the the employee in this case, but that um, was very much defined by the by the lead or by the supervisor themselves. So for example, in the foundry, it the, the lead in a way or the supervisor could define, like the department lead could define of how he wants to treat his team. So this was with ex exceptionally good, uh, which I also tried to take over later on when I became lead or supervisor. And at a double negative, because that's kind of a, of a huge company, right? So they have worldwide more than 1,000 employees. Um, and also in London at their peak times, I think they can go up to 1,000 um, just in the London office itself. So you kind of need a certain structure um, to deal with this amount of people. Um, because the more people you have, the more difficult it becomes to um, please everyone. So it's kind of, okay, you still are a business and you need to be efficient and you want to, to, to hire people who can do their work. Uh, but at the same time, you need to keep the motivation up. You need to keep your people happy in a way, make them want to come to work. So you want them to wake up in the morning and, and they, should, they should not have the ideas like, Actually, today I really don't want to go work. It's it's nice, nah, stay long and bad. So this is for me the first indication for myself. For example, where it's like, okay, is it actually me which doesn't want to work, or is it something I don't feel comfortable with? Why I don't want to go to to a workplace, right? And and double negative because of the size, they actually have these positions in place which kind of take care of individual artists. So for example, they have artist managers, which is they, as far as I understood it, one of their functions is that they take care of the well-being of each of each individual. So while in smaller companies, maybe that maybe that is the HR department. In in other companies, maybe that is the supervisor or the lead. So it's it can vary, um, and yeah, it really depends on the budget the company have. So do you, as a big company, do you already include kind of this? These positions or this process into your budget and if you don't have it how else would you want to deal with it right i mean it always comes down to to uh, like the more the bigger it is the more budget you have the the more people suddenly involved normally yes. maybe it's if it's like 50 people 100 people like in a total uh, it's maybe one person who who does all this uh, this hang hangling but when it becomes like really big uh, it's suddenly like a manager a producer hr the supervisor the lead and maybe even some other diversity or something like that manager and here it comes down to to the thing what do you define as a team right because um in reality everyone is part of the team 
it's not just let's say the lead or the supervisor um and the artist he has or she has so it's it's also the producer it's the production team it's the hr and the people it's the it department um it's the the tds in the background who build for example a pipeline um but you maybe don't interact a lot with them so the team itself can be huge and it depends on what level you you want to look at it and and how far do you want to build it up or connected with each other maybe give give us a little bit of of your opinion what is a good productive and healthy team basically how do you like how do you define it because in the end of the day i mean if this is the goal of this episode basically from both sides like you know you want to work in a team so you have to recognize a healthy productive and safe and whatever whatever buzzwords we can throw in um and on the other side if you are a ceo a supervisor producer every, everyone who builds who has the power to build or to maintain um maybe a manager or something um it's it's have to be from both sides it has to be clear what how does it look like before you can even start so what would you say like what are the pillars or the definitions or how would you like say this is something i i want this is where i'm striving for and this is something i can check against a, a little bit to know this is healthy this is productive to give you a short answer is probably when you come to work and you see that your team is motivated and you can have a good laugh with them i think that That would be for me where you say, okay, everything seems to be fine. Um, or also to recognize it is basically on the frustration level, I would say. So, so for me, that's always the first indication. So usually most projects have um, reached at some point uh, like where everyone becomes frustrated, right? So you get all these tasks and they stack on each other or you run into multiple issues. And the schedule goes on and the, the, the time becomes uh, more tight, like schedule becomes more tight. So kind of um, the stress level in a way increases. And with that also, I would say the frustration level. And in my opinion, how the team deals with this frustration, that's how you can see if the team is still in a good and a healthy shape, I would say. So if the frustration level is so high, um, that it kind of starts to demotivate people or unmotivate people and um, they become not very productive and more efficient, um, then that's definitely a point where as a, as a person in charge, you should take care of and you should um, um, have a more active impact or active interaction with the situation. In regards to the pillars, so as you said, um, so the highest priority for me or the, the most important point within a team and to establish a good team is communication. So communication should always be on a very good and high level with, with, within the teams so or with, with each of them. So the artist between each other, with the artist to the supervisor, with the supervisor to production, with artist to production. So basically we give all of them to each other. Um, so you always want to be able to express your opinion, like to say what you think, um, um, talk about issues try to solve things right so all is kind of dependent on communication and i think most problems maybe even all you can solve with good communication so i'm um, very strong believing in that so that's why it's for me the highest priority um, another important point would be that everyone within a team should know what is expected from from that person right so what are the expect expectations towards me so what what does the company want then as well as responsibility so what are my responsibility responsibilities and and what um do i have to take care of at the same time what i always try is um to challenge to ch challenge sorry to challenge everyone so each each artist in a way so you don't want to give only tasks which become boring over the time so that's very mm, demotivating in a way and frustrating at the same time so you always want to give tasks or shots or work that basically challenge that individual so what happens here is so that person maybe doesn't know at the beginning of how to resolve that issue but it means now okay that person learns that person develops further and therefore um feels also better because you're kind of achieving new things and you can be more proud of of 
once you actually solved that, right? Or you did it once you finished the shot or you got it approved and you, yeah, it was something new for you. So definitely a challenge. Um, another important point, motivation, as I mentioned before. Um, so that should always be tried to keep as high as possible. And there's probably various um, methods, but it's very unique to each team. Right, so comp the companies can do um, team building exercises. They can have events, parties, um, but most importantly here, it is that the team itself can work good with each other. So that's why recruitment, for example, is an important part that you want to create people who are good between each other. So they can communicate well, they, they build kind of a, a stronger relationship, right? It's not just um, a colleague and yeah, please do that and then let that's it. I don't need to talk to you anymore. No, that you don't want to create that. Having said that, as as well, you want to have this free, open spirit. You want this freedom, this openness within your team. You want to be able to express your opinion. You want to be able to talk about your ideas, and you also want to be taken serious when you do that. Right? It's not it should not be just ah, you're just a junior. I don't care what you actually say. That's wrong. So everyone should have the same kind of voice. Um, especially when it goes to ideas um you want to in addition to that so you want to have fun you want to enjoy your work um you kind of want to feel happy in the workplace and all of that together in combination with motivation i think that um creates a very strong basis of how you should create and build a team and keep it um highly productive in a way I mean, of course, it's, it is still like a little bit of an abstract construct. So that's why what I want to do in the in the, in the next uh, minutes to kind of break it down a little bit to give it a little bit of a context because uh, always sounds really good, but uh, like happiness and communication and stuff like that. It's like re like every relationship. Basically, you want this this pillows, but uh, too much. There is something as too much communication. There is something as too much uh, being open. You know, sometimes you just should shut up and don't express the negative feelings that you have because it's your feelings. It has nothing to do with anyone. It's your problem. Sometimes you have to process them before uh, you should communicate them. You know, there's a lot of like details involved, but that was, that's something um, I'm curious about. So let's, let's imagine we have the, the, the perfect situation in this kind of building a team um, thing where we start at zero. So we have this, we, we have a new project, we're doing an animation film or visual effects film. Let's keep it like, I would say lighting. I, would, I think we both are because you're a lighting supervisor. I, I'm a lighting TD That's that, that matches. So it is a little bit our, our background, a little bit easier. So let's say we have a project we want um, to have, I don't know, let's say 20 people. Um, and you, you have the option of, of choosing. You are the supervisor and you have the option of choosing. So how would you like, go through this road as like of recruiting your team basically as my function as a supervisor i was actually part in a lot of in in uh, a majority of the recruitment process not so much a double negative so in there i think supervisors are actually not so much involved in the recruitment process it's more like other um positions but at arcs animal i was let's say lucky enough to really be there and to to be able to communicate with the individuals like with the artists beforehand um, and to find like the strengths and the weaknesses in a way and to to see if the person would be a perfect fit for our team um, so in the recruitment process is it's actually not so 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 easy as you people might think so often you say okay you just go in the recruitment process you ask like you go in the interview you ask your questions which you have written down and based on the answers you you choose right I mean Ultimately, yeah, that's correct. But for me, it was important um, to know the person because often enough to to define like skill wise, that's one of the important parts, right? You need a person who who is who can do the task. So so you judge the skill. Um, for that, you usually have the the showreel itself. So you don't necessarily need the interview if you just consider the showreel. Um, and if you have the nice breakdown, you also know exactly what the artist actually did in each shot, for example. So that already gives you a very good understanding of, of the skill set of the artist. And you have usually the CV, which tells you, okay, what softwares do you use? What, how sufficient are you in the softwares? What is your past experience? So from skill point, you kind of already get 
a lot of things defined with the material everyone sends you. And for me, the important point is more, is the artist, does the artist fit into the team? Like from, from a person, personality wise, how does the artist can handle um, pressure if you gain the situations or if there is a problem like, um, or a challenge comes up, right? Your shot is absolutely not doing what you want to do. How do you deal with this situation? So, and that is for me the more the point which I try to figure out during the recruitment process. So I try to ask questions which are more personal. So you cannot necessarily think about them ahead. So it's, it's for example, I give you an example of what I like to ask, especially in regards to lighting, is that the artist please tell me a shot or a sequence of any movie you like and why you think the lighting in this movie is good. That would be a question I would like to ask because this is um, something which takes the person a bit out. So you're kind of not prepared for it beforehand, usually. And you start have to think about, okay, why? So what do you really like and why do you like it? Because usually um, you watch movies, but often enough, you don't really think about them. You like it or you don't like it. But taking out a specific sequence or a shot, it makes you think more now. And that's often then in the interview a surprise because you, you kind of catch a person off guard in a way, which I don't do because I want to be evil. I just want to see how the person reacts to it, right? Um, ultimately, it's more the reaction to, to this question rather than what the answer really is. And that's then giving me more an insight of the personality. So and, and based on that, you want to see, okay, with the people you already have in your team, can you work with this person? How does it handle situation it was not prepared for? It also shows, I think, uh, like a little bit of the passion behind that because some people can like do things mechanically, you know, like yes. modeling or lighting. They, they learn the, the three point lights and they can do a decent lighting. If you do it for, for like some days, you basically get the gist done and you, it will work after a while. It's not that you'll, that, that not everyone can produce a decent lighting with this technology nowadays. But I feel like this that I really like about this question is actually be do people pay attention during yes. during their normal normal things, you know, like during like I was I was actually thinking, I was trying to answer this question and and for some reasons, I don't know why, I uh, like Blade Runner uh, or something like would, that came yes. into my mind. Yes. Um, because I, I, it was, I love this kind of God race and it's very dark and very bright situations kind of, and, uh, this kind of light going through. That it is actually very interesting that you said Blade Runner, because I would say like 30 to 40% of, of applicants actually say Blade Runner. <laughs> yes. And what I experienced is that people often, or artists often use recent movies or very, very defined ones. For example, as you said, Blade Runner, it's very rare that you get an answer, which is like a, a not so blockbuster like movie, or which is not that strong defined based on lighting because Blade Runner has a very defined lighting. So it's a very defined style and it's very dominant. So it's easy to remember or recent movies also very easy to remember. For example, when Soul came out, um, a lot of applicants said Soul, of course, lighting wise, it's a masterpiece. So obviously it will be used, but then specifying a sequence becomes then more into the detail. And you also want, you can kind of see the analytical um, skill of a person. So how do you, how do you look at an image? How do you see like more the artistic skill? Because in the show reels, you rarely see the artistic skill in it because you're kind of following whatever the supervisor um, told you to. So if you, if he says make the rim light stronger, you make the rim light stronger, but in the end, you don't really see in a show reel the artistic skill of a, of a person necessarily. This then gives me more of a feeling of, okay, how does the person look at, at the image? Um, do you think about it? Do you analyze it? And, and even if, if the answer is, I mean, the answer cannot be wrong at all in this case, it's, it's really more like it makes the person think. So even if the, if the artist then does not get the job, what I hope out of that, of questions like this, um, is that the artist starts then afterwards thinking about, oh, actually, maybe I should do that. Or maybe that would actually help me further in my career. So that's what I like in doing rec in, in recruitment. So being part of there and then really getting into discussions with people. So I'm not so much a fan of having these strict answers. 
like the strict questions answered. It's more like, okay, let's create a, a dialogue and and let's talk straight and see how we can work with each other. On one side, you try to get the uh, soft skills uh, done to, so you understand is like, is that is that a pleasant person to talk to? Is it a pleasant person to, because I mean, you cannot work with them in an interview, that's impossible, but exactly. you're, it's basically just kind of like, he's, has it he a positive vibe? You feel like mm -hmm. it's, it's, is it positive to talk with him? It's not like, you know, like very tense and very kind of like, uh, you have to uh, like extract the information literally with each question <laughs> and stuff like that. And the other side is you, instead of going onto the skill, because that's something I, I tell, um, I tell my clients and people like because uh, like when i'm doing like interview coaching something is like no one cares about your skills in the interview it's if you don't do like a test for a very specific thing sometimes you do like for programming you sometimes do a programming or a technical test but 90 percent, especially on this industry no one cares about your skill it's already done it's already showreel yes. it's already uh checked with, with in the in the in the interview it's about this and what i like the second part is is the real education behind that skill Yeah. It's this like you know that is a free point light. You know why you, why something works or doesn't work, or yes. uh, you, you you know you're doing kind of a meta testing skill thing. Not like uh, show them a picture and they have to define what kind of light situation or something with some uh, lexica words or something. You're more okay. Do you think about that and process that? And there's a thought behind what you do instead of just like a technical thing, which basically can everyone learn in watching like five weeks of YouTube videos and then everyone can do like a decent lighting, to be honest. Yes, I totally agree. Um, it's more, as you mentioned, maybe it's called soft, maybe you want to call it soft skill, but it's really to get the understanding of how the artist um, um, works or sees um, his work or an image. Uh, but besides that, it's also a huge difference uh, when you talk with applicants on what skill level they are based on the experience, right? So usually when you have more experienced applicants, then the interview is very straightforward because um, they're very, they're not nervous at all. Um, they're, they're very relaxed usually in the interview and then it's kind of, they have nothing to lose in a way. It's like, okay, I don't get this one. It's fine. I have 10 other interviews. Um, in the end, they, they kind of choose where they want to go. So it, it's kind of a different thing. So when you work with more, when, or when work, when you interview more experienced people, for me, what I try to feel in those interviews is more the motivation in the person. So do you, are you still motivated to be in this industry, right? Um, because experienced over the years that you um, meet people which are in the industry for 10, 20, 30 years, and you kind of feel that they're not that motivated or inspired anymore. Um, compared to fresh graduates or junior artists, you really feel this motivation, this inspiration. And, and that's one of the things which I very much value within a team to have um, this, let, I call them bright people. They have a very strong aura in a way, positivity, this motivation, inspiration, because it kind of reflects on other people. It, it infects them and it makes them kind of it makes them motivated again so if you're kind of there and you sit and then you get a person in there which brings you this this activity this this liveliness into it it kind of infects everyone and has a very positive um impact for the whole team so ultimately within a team you want kind of this very hyper motivated people in there um who, who push you further and they they give you kind of a wake-up call if you're already more experienced and it's like Yeah, I actually look at this person is really happy, even though nothing, everything looks wrong, maybe. But this, this inspiration, this motivation is very, very much helping myself as well to keep going, push further, to be better. Yeah, that also reflects a little bit of my experience. Uh, the more experience you get, the more the, the interview becomes more of a coffee uh, sitting you know like <laughs> hey what's up you know and then you're just you just uh, sometimes i don't even talk about anything like literally don't talk about the project sometimes it's like just literally like high five and then you talk about random stuff uh, maybe something you're passionate at the moment you know maybe you're building boats or something and then you start to talk about building boats in the interview and then you still get hired and that's that's a little bit of thing that that, that comes with i think with the higher level because people are more or less 
it's again the soft skills. He's experienced. We know that he's experienced. He worked there and there. He worked on that on that project. Um, is he is pleasant to work with? So if we can have a decent conversation with him, um, then everything is fine. You said on this part, you still want the motivation, which I absolutely understand because I feel like that's something you struggle with experience. You lose, especially in, in this kind of industries, you lose this motivation because your um, you achieve everything you wanted to do after a while you do the projects you do the companies you do whatever uh, and then it's like what's there next and then you have to kind of shift your motivation because now you have the credits you have all the stuff and it's like another one another like star wars or another or whatever is like okay it's the same thing a little bit um, so I, it's interesting that you still kind of focus on that. Do you have something where you feel like, because you mentioned you want to have this kind of motivator people, do you have like a battery of, of specific roles you want to have in your team? Like, you know, the one, the wise one, the comedian, basically the A team uh, for the team, like, like, of course, not everyone, but specific people that, that you feel like you need them in the team because you cannot have like all motivated juniors or something like that, you know? Another very good question. Um, here it depends really on the size of the team, I would say. So as you said, if we build, um, when I supervised uh, my last two teams, let's say, um, they were very different in size. So you had a bigger one, which was almost 20, um, and then a smaller one, which contained of seven people, like just specifically to lighting, I mean. Um, and it's, it's very different. So the first time, um, I was also very new in creating a team and building a team. And um, I think I did a lot of things um, not the right way. So I should have done it in a better way. So I was more successful, I, in my personal opinion, with the follow-up projects because I could more um, see how can people better work with each other. So, so here it depends basically on the team size. So what do you want to have in a team? Like what personalities, as you mentioned, like do you have different characters? So I think here the best would be if you have a mixture of seniors, mid-level and juniors. So I think um, even if you have a high quality production or um, you're limited with the budget and you cannot afford a huge team. For example, I find it very important that you have juniors in your team or if you don't have the space for juniors, maybe you open up positions for interns um, and you give them a possibility or volunteers to see it feels because the general feeling what I have to as an individual to have a good feeling within a company or within a team is is the following two attributes is you have people who are ahead of you so they're way more experienced and you kind of can learn from them so that gives you this inspiration so you have a person sitting next to you where you say oh wow this this person is amazing and I can learn a lot but just watching or talking with, with this person, with this artist, right? That gives you the motivation to move on. And what is also important that you have people who are not as experienced as yourself, who are kind of behind you. So they're still having a longer way to, to reach the level you are, for example. So they are, they're looking up to you in a way. So I think you, you need both to feel kind of comfortable in your place, because if you have, um, you have on one side, the people which you are looking up to, which gives you this, this inspiration or motivation or this, this possibility to learn. And then you have, on the other hand, the people who are looking up to you, which means you kind of are the person which gets appreciated and you can show others your knowledge, your experience, and you can teach them. And that usually gives also people a, a, a fulfilling emotion fulfilling feeling in a way that okay you did something good and you're helping other people and also this combination kind of connects everyone with better with each other and and because i mentioned interns or juniors why i think they're important in a team is because they're fresh from from the school or university or just they're so motivated in 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 drawing for example Maybe they didn't visit a school, but your skill level is, is, is good that you say, oh, we give, the, we give it a try. Um, and usually they bring this motivation into the team because they are so uh, eager to learn. They're, they're, they, they just cannot stop. They're the, the artists which work for 20 hours and they're still not tired. They're still 
want to move on and they will talk about everything and you can really nerd out and geek out with them. So you're still in the progress where you say, oh yes, let's talk about um, this shader in a very detail, why this highlight should behave this way. Um, so you, you, you really feel like more back to school where you, where you really go into detail and geek out about, about everything where you can, because you kind of love what you're doing compared to the seniors, which are, they know everything or most of the things. And they sometimes kind of need these people next to them. Um, I think that's that's very important to keep the team as a whole running. So basically, you you try to balance like a realistic expectation from like a senior who has like, okay, I know how this will work because I did it like twenty times already, and this high kind of like high motivational, let's do one hundred ten percent attitude where you maybe ar achieve that, but only if you have someone who balances out with a realistic plan, um, but. On the, that's basically a little bit what you said and before is like uh if you get like seniority you lose motivation then but you have like someone like a little bit more green green uh, like blue eyes behind that maybe he pushes you up because you feel this this kind of like oh like i i I want to work on this cool project and and then like, okay, maybe. And it's also something uh, reminds me of what I talked about with Andrew Schlossel. Um, he is uh, for, for education development at Framestore. And we talked about uh, like, not just like the education of the company, like, you know, the company provides education, but also to how important it is that everyone, especially on a senior lead and so roles, has the opportunity of educate his surroundings, you know, that because I feel like this is part of a general motivation and also a general basic need uh, is to kind of um, to because you lose the need of um, impress yourself or the project because you kind of achieved a lot of things in this case. Now you kind of um, need a new need. And I feel like the, the higher in the seniority you are, the more it can be fulfilled with educating like your surround, you don't have to become a teacher or like yes. just like a small mentor or a good neighbor, basically to your, uh, to you, the one who is sitting next to you. I think this is something, uh, it's essential basically, I think to a team. Yes. I think it's, it's, it's a very good point. It's one of those where I think this would be essential in a team, but also the more experienced, yeah, it's not, it depends really then on the character and that's where the recruitment process um, comes back in. Does a person fit in because you have people who simply don't want to deal um, with inexperienced people just because you can have a sense of, okay, I'm wasting my time, right? My time is too precious. It, it can be frustrating sometimes if you, it depends on how, how they use their inexperience in the, in the exactly. project, you know, are they just pushing forward and then like, I know it better. I'm, I uh, like, I'm did it for half a year. I know it better than you, uh, or is it something where you feel like. I don't know, they learn very fast and you just progress with them. Correct. And that's that's where you then need to balance it out because as every artist is very different and that's that what makes it so so unique. Every team is kind of unique. You, you will never have the same team twice, except you literally get the same people on the same project, on the next project again. Over the time of a project or of a production, you kind of learn more about each each person and you kind of see, okay, the, the strengths, weaknesses of each of them. And you want to, to balance it out that everyone feels like comfortable in their role. So if you have, for example, people who are more quiet, they want to be more on, on their own island. Um, just for example, give me, give me the shots you need me to do. And, and that's it. I don't want to communicate so much with the rest of the team. That, that can be very well, right? So you, you can have these people and it's perfectly fine. Um, you put them on the island, you, you give them kind of what they need. It's, they're very straightforward to work with, um, usually very reliable and um, very good for, for production because they kind of make a schedule a lot <laughs> based on them. But here it's important that you also give them this freedom, right? So if you have this person who needs that, who wants this silence, let's say, or this feeling of loneliness in a way, then as a team, you should be able to respect that and also provide this possibility that, that this person can have it. And here it comes then also that other, the other people within the team, the other artists within the team, they understand this, um, this needs, let's say, and you don't kind of start 
um, oh, he doesn't want to be part of us. That's that's not true. It's just you just have different characteristics and you want to find a way that all of them can work with each other. And you know, okay, you know that a person, even though a person might be quiet, but it's an expert in certain, in, in, I don't know, shading organic characters, then you have questions. You probably can go there anytime you want and the person will be very happy to help you. So that's, it should not give you this feeling, oh, I cannot talk to this person, right? And that's what I mean with you need this feeling of freedom and every artist needs this feeling of they can be free and they can to talk to people and they don't need to feel like, okay, this is maybe not so much my my area or I'm, I'm too scared. I don't dare to ask this person. Um, so it's kind of how you build a team and what, what rules in a way you establish. Um, and that goes back also to the recruitment process. So you can have people who are really a-holes. You try to filter them out already in the recruitment where you say, okay, you definitely don't fit into our team. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone is afraid of cursing in the show. I don't know why it's this American <laughs> thing. Well, in case, you, in case, you know, in case small children are watching and they want to, yeah, get into the industry. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to keep everything also a little bit in, in realistic terms because we were just uh, talking in a very luxury environment, basically in, in a, if we can get everyone, if we can build a dream team, basically, but that's not realistic. Most people will not have the benefit of backed up by DNEC or Foundry or uh, on the other side, uh, applying for Foundry, applying for DNEC or anything else like that. Um, so is there something, because like, let's say like, for example, at ARCS, uh, was there something because it was it's not a big company it's also in vienna which is a little bit a little bit isolated compared to the industry and stuff like that so there's not much going on um, was there something where you reached out yourself or was there something where you kind of uh, actively approached or did something to to get people with arcs i was lucky enough that i actually did not have to find people so we had a a, a good hr department or recruitment department who was looking out um spreading their wings and trying to find people, trying to set up um, these interview possibilities or um, making sure I get all the the applicants um, sent per email to what I probably want to interview or which have a huge potential to be to be fitting into our team. So here that, that was uh, very good work from them. And in the end, then once they have this, uh, let's say limited number of applicants. So as you said, um, Aust Vienna is quite, um, confined and we don't get like this huge amount of applications. Um, you still try to find the specific individuals out of this, this the bunch which which you want to create a team out of. But in the end, um, you always take chances. So often I also have like this gut feeling. Okay, it, I'm not sure about the skill of a of a person, but I have a good feeling that it that um, he or she fits very good with, with all the others within the team. And as you mentioned before, um, certain skills, like let's say if it's a software you want to learn or if it's, okay, how do I use render layers or AOVs? That's things you can teach. But then the other, the other soft skills you kind of not, um, you need a certain development in there already, I would say. Um, where you can say, okay, that's, that's now good. It just takes more time, like a hard skill, like, you know, yes. you can re yeah. learn something in, in weeks, you know, but like a soft skill, how to approach people, how to react to criticism. It's, it's like a lifelong journey, basically. It's good that you mentioned also criticism and, and, um, that point, for example, what, um, I mentioned a bit at the beginning, one of the pillars, I think, uh, one of the most important is the communication. So while you have your team um, or the limited choices you have from recruitment, right? And you build a team with, 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 with that. Um, I think no matter how, on, let's say not no matter, but it can become very complicated uh, with a lot of people and everyone has their own needs. Um, what then helps here is a very strong communication. So. Uh, what I always try to do 
is to communicate with each person individually. So um, to, to take my time when they need it to talk to. So often you have people who don't understand certain things or they cannot work with other people within the team, right? So you get difficult times. So um, what happens is that you kind of start getting a friction and what is then the best approach to get out of the friction or to understand it. So often the friction happens of misunderstandings so that people don't understand each other and or that the supervisor doesn't understand an artist or the artist doesn't understand the supervisor. Um, you don't understand what is needed. What do they want from me? Um, I'm really struggling with, with the work and no one is helping me. Um, you kind of, friction doesn't come from nowhere. So it's kind of a build up usually, like a frustration. You know, a person can be really frustrated, right? So and here then communication is for me the, the way to go so that you really take this person aside. It can be um, someone above your hierarchy or lower your hierarchy in a way. And you go in a room, meeting room, or you go for a drink outside, it does not matter. And you take your time and talk to this person. You, you don't have to talk around the topic, just go really straight to the point. So what is the problem? Let's talk about it. If you have a problem with, with me, for example, of how I'm treating you or what I say to you, then this, is, this can be a topic. Or do you have a problem with another artist? Um, then maybe we should talk also with the other artist. So kind of find a way of communication. I think that almost solves all the, the issues or the frictions or the frustrations you can have. It can also be from a private nature, right? You, you kind of have difficulties in your private life. And usually that has an impact also on your professional, like on your working life. Here's also important, for example, for me to, to understand that the person. So what, how can I help you in a way? I don't need to know your, your private problems. You don't need to tell me what, what is going on in your private life. Really, I don't ask for that, but what am I possible or how am I possible to help you? Is it that you need some time off? Or is it um, that you just cannot focus at work because your mind is always somewhere else? Let's say, um, yeah, you watched a series on Netflix and you really want to know what happens next and you're constantly thinking about the series. So it can be really something simple, but it kind of takes you out of the focus, right? And then you need to focus on your shot, but your mind is completely somewhere else. So so how can you help with that? And then once I know these things, I can we can kind of, kind of come up with solutions. I can say, well, take an hour off, take two hours off, watch watch the episode you need to watch and then come back, you know. <laughs> what I also very much like in this industry, you're kind of flexible with time. I mean, not, not dramatically flexible, but you can, you can shift a bit, quite good in a way, because we are often, especially in lighting, for example, we are shot based working. So let's talk with production. Let's see if we can schedule this shot to next week and shift it a bit around. Maybe another artist can help us out. But for me, it's important that artists can be focused on their work. And if you have frictions or communication issues or private issues, then what is the pos best possible way how to help that artist out in this specific situation? So what can you offer as a company or as a supervisor to yeah, get that person back in a way? You know, and that's the way where you you where communication basically is the way to go in from my point of opinion. I think it's a good segue to to the next part because I feel like before you you go into this whole communication, I think always the the starting point when you when the team first starts, I think creates a lot of what comes next basically. So if the start is bad, if if uh, I had a situation where I started and I, I didn't have an introduction multiple times um, and I hadn't I didn't had an introduction, I was just like thrown into the deep end and people were expecting from me to perform. And it's this kind of a producer thinking like nine, nine women will pr produce a baby in one month. Um, situation where uh, in theory, yes, that's possible. I, I, I know how to do lighting. I know how to do programming. I don't know whatever the task is, but the problem is a lot of times all this around that, like, you know, how is the pipeline structured? What is exactly the project? How is the hierarchy even? How is the communication? A lot of times it's not as simple as you think, oh, he's the supervisor, but actually the lead is the one who calls the shots on all these decisions and all this kind of jazz. So I feel like um, one of the most important parts to kind of 
create this atmosphere of communication and already battle a lot of issues that you that you potentially can invite when you be, put people on the edge of i feel i feel like i'm not performing and a lot of times from my point of view it comes from two situations a is you throw people into and they don't get enough time in the beginning to feel comfortable not with their skill per se but using their skill in this environment and B is integrating the person in terms of the team, like, you know, giving them time that everyone has the opportunity to at least get a feel for each other. So they know a little bit of how does it, what does it mean if the person did, that says it this way, or how is a little bit of that? And I feel like if you miss this, this, this two steps too much, the more you pay later with all this miscommunications, uh, problems of motivation, because people like, okay, if I, I feel always overwhelmed anyways, I feel always like I'm not performing. And sometimes it's not even the person's fault. I mean, you know, in a way, maybe if with extra work, you can bal balance it out. But sometimes it's like, it's a little bit unfair to ask someone, yeah, I didn't give you the time, but if you work 12 hours for the next three, four months, then you will catch up and you will do a good job. And um, so what would be like the, the step for you after you collected your team with also different skills, having your some juniors into that, having some wise gray ones into that? Um, what will be like the first weeks that you feel like uh, if you build a new team that you should do or they should do? Because you mentioned the introduction, right? So um, that you feel like missing out. So you had the experience that you miss out the, the this introduction feeling when you join a company that you kind of get thrown into into this bunch of random strangers and now you kind of have to work with them. I mean, it, it depends on the company, as you mentioned, like, uh, for example, at Weta, it's kind of like uh, they expect uh, one year until you're fully kind of arrived and you're on the same level productivity as everyone else. So I'm pretty sure like DNAC or something has probably uh, uh, someone the same scale, maybe like lesser time, but um, like the, there's a clear line of we don't expect from you the same level in the beginning and we have mechanism in place so you can get a little bit to catch up. So here is, for example, important, which I mentioned at the beginning is how free and how honest can you be with your team or should you be with your team? So when you have a new person starting or also you have a, a team already there, um, for me, it's important that the person knows what is expected. So I think as an artist or as a lead, as a supervisor, you need to know what is the expectation from the company on you. So what, what is required? What are your responsibilities in a way? So I experience a lot that it, this is, can be very unclear or vague. So you're not sure, um, okay, I just have now in my, in my um, task list all these random shots, um, but, but it's kind of vague. So when do I need to, what do I need to, how do I need to, with whom should I talk? Um, that, at the big, especially when you join new into a team or in a project, right? You usually have like these millions of questions, which kind of you're not sure who to ask or who to talk to, and you kind of don't get that. But everyone has already these expectations that you know what's going on. And um, in here, it's more than this openness that to from the beginning onwards, you kind of clear these things up. So even before a person joins the company, you want to try, for example, in interviews to make the artist understand what is expected from from that person so it's not only the choice from my side if i want to hire a person it should also be the choice of the artist if i want to be in this company or if i want to do this job by already knowing what i will be doing and what are the expectations about me so what does the company want from me and and during a production and um, that can change of course because productions are very uh, evolving into different areas or directions over over the time, and it's often necessary that artists also adjust to that. But it should always be clear of what is needed from each of them, and to help in that, as you mentioned before, I think this introduction period or how we call it a ramp up time is mandatory. So it's really important that if you get a person on the team or onto a production that you give that person a ramp up time. So even, even, you know, for example, you already get some, someone experience, you know, I know this person can do the task. I know the person knows Houdini or Maya or Nuke and 
and just give them the shot and do that. Um, that's the situation which I usually don't want to do. I don't want to be in a situation where I have to throw in an artist and tell that person, that's your shots, please try to finish them until next week. So that would be, the, for me, the worst case scenario. Unfortunately, it can happen or happens more often than you, you want to. But if you have a person joining a new team, give them the time, give them a task where you, where they can understand what is the workflow, how does the pipeline work. Um, give them tasks where they are forced to talk with other people, right? So you kind of start to connecting with others within your team. Let other people know, okay, we have, for example, a team, what I like to do is before someone new joins into a team, um, I usually try ahead of time, like a few days before, let the team know we're getting someone new into the team and also tell them about the experience level or the skill level so people understand, okay, there can be a person coming in who has a lot of questions and it's completely fine. Or there can be a person coming in who actually knows what's going on and can help us on topics where we maybe struggle currently, right? So, so the team understands the function of this new, new person coming in. Um, the purpose in your way. It's like, guys, we, we get a new artist, no overtime from tomorrow. Yeah, that, <laughs> that would be, yeah. <laughs> Basically. But, but yeah, that's actually, I remember that, to be honest. I remember we, we, we had this, this uh, at least weekly uh, and daily meetups. And then every time someone come like next week or something, uh, depends on how important his role wa was. I remember that that, uh, that you and the other supervisor were always mentioning kind of like, oh, we get this to solve a little bit of this problem. Kind of, you know, like we get a new TD or we get a new da 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 to help us with that and that and that specific thing to to ease the burden or to solve a specific issue. Uh, and that's, that's something I really, really like because it always you always felt like, um, you know, there's progress kind of going on also around you. I think as an artist, you need to know, you need to see kind of the end, right? You need to see, okay, this is the shot I have to do this, this or this is the task I have to do. Like for TDs, usually it's it's not shot-based, it's often task-based, um, that you kind of see, okay, this is my reward in a way. You want to, to get the feeling, for, for example, artists. So when I was an artist, I often felt like, if I get my shot approved, that's my reward. That makes me feel happy. So I finally, after 100 million retakes, I finally get it approved. Um, and that's a very good feeling you, you get like over the time. And TDs also need um, where it's more task based. You kind of need the same emotion in a way. You need to feel like you're achieving something. You're going further. You're not going two steps back. You're always making step further, step further, step further to within the team to finish the production, to finish this task, to finish the movie, um, the advertisement, whatever it is, right? So you want to get a feeling of, okay, we're getting closer to the end and we're doing a good job. So it's important that you have this feeling that what you're doing is actually fine. Often you don't know, is what I'm doing, is it, is it good or is it bad? Can I, should I do it differently? And that's where then communication comes in place. So um, you rather want to talk as a supervisor, for example, you rather want to talk earlier to a member of your team if something does not work out or if you say, Hey dude, you you uh, I can feel your frustration. It has kind of an impact on other people. Maybe let's talk about it first. Or I can see um your work is starting to um to lose kind of this this laugh to to the detail, or it's kind of starting to weaken. Um, so let's talk about it. You know, you you kind of point it out. Welcome to our short mid episode coffee break. If you love the content and would like to have a successful career in the film or games industry yourself, check out my website 21artistshow.com. There you can find helpful articles, masterclasses and coaching opportunities that help dozens of my students to bring their profession to the next level. That's all. Check out 21artistshow.com and share the podcast with cool people you know. Let's continue with the episode. <sighs> Because the problem is with this is always you can talk too early and too late. It's this this thing because if you talk too early, you make a fuss out of something else, nothing. And if too late, it's it's maybe of course it kind of becomes this rooted inside kind of problem. Um, how do you like nowadays define it? Like 
okay, I need to talk now. There's like no option anymore. Usually for me, the rule is as soon as it starts impacting others, then I have to talk with this person. So as, as soon as other um, uh, people or other, or other parts of the department or production get somehow involved or having to deal with consequences based on that or having an impact, then before that happens, you should act. So you should kind of find a way, okay, now is the time I have to talk because now it starts involving others. And then once others get involved, that the, it, be, it can become more complex and complicated to actually then find solutions afterwards. I think that's always the, I think one of the hardest parts um, also nowadays, uh, we talked about that before, is like the expectation nowadays are so high from yourself, from your environment, from your work, because you're bombarded with, with high-end production nowadays. You consume more than ever before. It all looks like Marvel quality. So you expect a little bit Marvel quality from yourself. Um, you on, on the flip side, you have this expectation from life. Life has to be happy and fulfilling and everything is, is great. And no one ever kind of tells you something negative, la, 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 la. So I feel like this, this thing of like hypersensitivity in terms of work and personality is, is something I feel is one of the biggest threats to um, the working together, the team itself. Um, it's not actually the work and it's not actually some real problems it's all i feel like it comes more from my experience um from the person itself you know the inner the inner expectation meets reality problem basically and like how would because that if that's that's something an issue of that how, do you do you address that actually that is a very important part in my opinion for any lead or supervisor um to to have a good impact on the team at least i hope so um is ex exactly this individuality of every person. So as you said, some people are very sensitive of how they take feedback, for example, how they take criticism. Others are more brute force as they just just give me, give me it. Come on, tell me what is wrong and I do it. If it if it, Yeah, exactly. If it's crap, tell me if it's crap. So that then um, I need to know what's going on. So in the end, the important point here is that the artist needs to understand what is the problem, right? So that, that is the ultimate result you want to have. The person needs to know what is wrong. So that, that is the goal you want, you, you need or you have. So is that also like the standard for you where you say, um, because there is something like professionalism and stuff like that, you know, to a certain degree, everyone has to, to understand criticism. You cannot just be yes. like uh, eggshells and stuff like that. So this is the, 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 is the main point for you is like, the criticism has to be understood at the end. If someone like blocks on that face, that's exactly. like so, a no so for you. It's basically what, what you do. Like you have usually a director, an art director, supervisor, and they kind of then make a decision of if a shot looks good or if something looks right, right? So the artist has their own opinion of what looks good and bad. So, or the supervisor has their own opinion of what looks good and bad. Ultimately, um, you have to follow what the client in this case wants because he's kind of paying your bread. So... Um, you want to achieve that result. So if you have an artist who makes a nice image and the person thinks, oh, that's, that's great. And it can be great. So I had a lot of, of, I saw a lot of works from, from my team, like from, from individuals who made amazing images. Like they look beautiful in, in lighting, for example, but unfortunately we could not use it because it's just not working within the movie or it's something the art director doesn't want. So in this case, how do you bring over the critics, right? Because obviously the image looks better, but it's not right. So and then you deal with the with the fact that everyone takes critics differently. So and here for me it's important where you say that contrary to what many people say, like everyone should be treated the same way. Um, I actually don't think so. I think. Um, it is better to treat everyone individually. And I'm not meaning of, of the, the basic rights a person has. You always want to treat everyone with respect. You always want to listen to everyone. But in a way, how you communicate with each person, that then becomes very, very, very unique, I would say. So you adjust, or you should, in my opinion, you should adjust to this situation. So if someone is sensitive to critics, but you still need the person to understand what is wrong, then you 
it comes it goes back to communication you talk to this person and explain why it's wrong so what what i saw what i see often is that you just get told what to change but you're not getting told why you have to change it usually if you start explaining people why this should be different the understanding of that makes it fine then okay i fully understand i agree this is why i have to change it and it also helps you to actually give the the artist a perspective of what needs to be done which means ultimately you you reduce the amount of retakes which you have because now the understanding is there what is actually needed and that's that's then individually so i had i had very different artists so for some people I actually you you kind of want to be uh, more the harsh person like having it said like maybe wrong so you want to be very straightforward and really straight to the point and say that's really not good that's that's absolute crap please do it again um and that works and then you have the people who say you really go into detail and explain them so i sit next to them and you really have to take your time so that's the important part you have to take the time and talk to this person and explain it so if you go to the computer of the person or if you if the you invite the person to the review room and and go through it point by point and explain it um i think that's the way to go ultimately you want to do it with everyone but usually you don't have the time and here comes then the point where in a good team you kind of don't need that time in a way not that that strict and so you have the whole team working together finding the solutions or finding or being able to help each other out so if if you say okay i did not understand what the supervisor actually wants from me and you can ask the neighbor next to you and that person is oh that's that's easy that's fine i completely understand what he wants because i had the same issues i had the same problems and in a way it helps so you in here it's again you need this team spirit the whole team working together on the project and not the feeling of oh god i need to create my shot quota every week or every month i need to create my 10 shots in a month so i can finish it it's that's for me not the right way to go i know productions work this way because you have to schedule it but in the end what matters is the whole team creates the numbers and not just each person it's actually a very complicated topic as what do you do you have an artist for example who does 30 shots in a month and then you have another artist on a similar skill level who does 5 shots a month how can you now justify to production to not swap out this one artist who only does 5 because if we swap him out and we get someone who can also do 30 shots we would be better off right um i actually don't agree because if you have a team which works really good well together every person within the team has a certain role as you mentioned early on what what can that role be so what is the reason why an artist has not or did not reach the quota right there can be a reason is it maybe that person was looking into issues into problems into certain td works something is not working so if that happens then this time spent of this person looking into these issues is a benefit for everyone else within the team because now you have a person who figured out what the issue was but based on that the person obviously could not make the shot numbers on the other hand you have someone who exceeds the shot numbers and compensates for the loss of this one person and that's then important for me how close can you work with your team how good connected are you with them how good connected a day with each other and to understand if someone is really exploiting the team or are they really all working together and trying to finish together so that's then for me the important part that's why i really try as much as i can as much as time allows me to communicate or to have individual talks with with the artist as much as possible i think it's also comes back to the book uh, from adam grant give and take which talks about like being a giver and give, being like a taker which is like kind of like do you just take from others and just try to get your edge and what your benefits or do you try to like give away you know all your time your advice you know not because of your ego but because pe people ask you like hey can uh, i don't know can you give it? and it ends up um, like statistically um, most givers start with the with the worst so they in the beginning for example if you look at uh, medical students, uh, they they have the the lowest grades. The givers, they have the lowest grades, while like the the takers uh, have the like much better grades. Like, but when they graduate, it flips. 
just because they, they need longer time to kind of establish themselves, they lose time. They also need a little bit of time probably to balance out how much they give and how much they he like stay like you know because you can give too much you know you can just be like you know running around trying to help even everyone's uh, solving his problems and then basically have no time and then end up with five five shots uh, instead of 13 as your colleague basically but there is this aspect of um that it it is an investment a little bit of you know also like in terms of the team that if you have some of this kind of giver mentality still on a healthy side not like uh, like, you know, basically destroying themselves just to please other people and to help them. But um, it's, a, it's a kind of investment. And if you, as you, as, a, as someone who looks a little bit and talks with the people, I think you can get a feeling of how much is this person just like, like lazy, unmotivated or whatever, just slow, or how much is he actually basically just uh, like taking out, out fires in the background that like basically no one no one sees because it's not his specific job but if he wouldn't do it maybe no one would or at least maybe it wouldn't be 30 shots but it would be 20 for the whole team you know so I understand your your approach to individualism and it's kind of also um, something that everyone wants in, in, in a sense you know everyone wants to take to be individual and stuff like that but in the end of the day, it's still a production. You get paid. Uh, it's not like your. It's not like your your fun time. Everything you know. So um, I feel like where is the line that you draw where you say, um, I have a schedule. You know, I cannot spend half an hour with with uh, the twenty or t like t ten artists who need an explanation all the time or who who need to circle multiple times till they really do what i want like where do you draw the line where you say that's over individualism and it starts to be kind of like personal problems and personal stuff that they bring into that and they lose professionalism i think it's difficult to say this is too far right so it definitely can happen so the worst case um what you can have that you actually have to let people go so that that would be in my opinion the worst case that you're forced to make the decision unfortunately you cannot work with us anymore so that i had to do it a few times but it's really the 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 area which i don't like because as i mentioned before um when people start getting into a situation where they become kind of unprofessional um it would be good to know why so what is the reason behind it um and is there a possibility to change it if not then usually what also helps you kind of find an a mutual agreement where both of you say okay maybe it's better that um, you stop for now and take a break and um, you take a break of, of this job of this task of this company and and let's see later on again if we if we want to rehire you um, it's again back to communication um, for now I was lucky enough I never had kind of these people in my team where you say okay I absolutely cannot talk with that person um, but as you mentioned, this individualism that you invest in people, that you spend your time with them, goes to a certain limit. As you said, it's a business, it's a production. We're on a schedule, we're on the clock. We, we like money flows, like time is not infinite. Is there like things where you say like, okay, I don't want to, to address individualism anymore because it becomes just like your own laziness your own taker mentality i think the the word laziness maybe is very very good in this case so usually when for me it reaches the limit usually for me when i get the feeling that the person does not want to improve or does not want to learn or does not want to understand it's just just give me that and that's it i don't i only need to so the rest i don't care so if you get this feeling of a person does not care anymore then you you kind of run into dangerous waters. So you, you go into dangerous waters in a way of, okay, we can, the longer this drags out, it can become an issue, not just for this one person, it, became, it can kind of have an impact on the team. Because maybe you don't care about your own work, but you should care about what impact it has for everyone else, right? So because you don't want to do a task or you, it's different if you cannot do a task, or if you don't want to do a task, then um, 
again, what is the reasons? So why do you don't want to do these tasks? There can be very valid explanations for it, or they can be just, okay, because I'm not in the mood. I don't want to do it because I know it's annoying. It's frustrating. Leave me alone. Can happen, right? Um, and it can happen to anyone. So I often have tasks where I say, oh no, why again? So, um, and here it can reach a limit. So how far do you want to drag it out? So as I mentioned, if I get this feeling that person kind of gave up, it doesn't want to, to continue. It doesn't want to put their energy into this project or their, their, um, doesn't want to be professional in a way as well, or doesn't want to find an agreement. So you can have also the same issue where you, you feel like, okay, I, we can talk whatever we want to, but we will not find a mutual agreement where we say, okay, this is how we can move forward. Then for me, that is the limit. Then I say, okay, please go back and do that. If you cannot do that, let's talk again. If I know you can do that and you just don't want to do it, it's a different topic. Then um, in the worst case, you start talking with production. You find, you maybe try to find workarounds. Okay, let's see if someone else can take over or is, uh, uh, wants to take it over or not. But sometimes you have these tasks where kind of, you know, no one wants to do it or it's really just annoying because it's kind of a, yeah, a time consuming task, which everyone knows how to do it, but it has to be done or shots, which are not really interesting. So you don't want to do them. So here it's, it's kind of, okay. Are you work? Are you working just for yourself? Are you working with the team? Are you working as, as a team? And as soon as I get this feeling that, um, you don't want to be a team player anymore, then there, there it becomes more complicated from, from my side. Yeah, it's actually something I experience uh, very rarely, but it happens at least once where I, I absolutely felt uh, it's like as a TD where I talked with an artist and he literally was ignoring what I was saying. Like, like uh, I, I absolutely was kind of like, this is not how I did it before kind of uh, situation or or um, why do I have to do this? You know, how why do I have to create a specific render layer or something like that? It's like, but it happens and... Um, it's it's super strange and for me this is definitely a limit uh basically like you said like a, a little bit of a mixture of laziness and giving up like a, a little bit of a um you like basically um the artist only does how he did before this is a problem with with more experienced artists especially um who are like uh, this is not how I did. And then you talk with them and maybe you're not as senior as they're like in terms of experience and they're like ignoring you a little bit because you, they're like, this is not how I do it. I do it my way a little bit. Maybe they say it clearly, maybe not. Maybe you see it in the next shot. It's still not done, uh, basically. Um, and I think this is definitely a limit where I feel like um, you can talk about that. You can remind that once, twice, but then there's a time where I feel like it doesn't like it doesn't help you. It doesn't help the person. It doesn't help the project because it, what happens, as you mentioned, uh, you suddenly have a broken shot. You suddenly have maybe missing IOVs, or render layers, or something like that, and then someone has to fix that. And suddenly, uh, or the, the person itself has to fix that because he has this feedback of technical uh, shot is technically not approved, and then he spends double the time. Uh, to create the, the same thing, basically, as someone who would do it in the beginning. When I was an artist. Um, and I worked on shots, I always considered it, this is my shot. I, I get, you get, I think most artists have it, um, especially when you start and you're not like this industry veteran where like a shot is just, yeah, next, next, next. Um, I think at the beginning you put a lot of your heart into each shot and that's why it's then so painful once the director decides to cut your shot out because it's not needed in the final edit um, or that you have to, that a shot gets reassigned to another artist, for example, because schedule wise, you, you cannot fit it in. Um, so, so here I think it's good if the artist has this connection to the work um, because that's how you kind of get the most out of it. The artist wants the shot to be good. It wants to be beautiful. It wants to put the best, the best, uh, into it what the person can do like look this is what i did it kind of it's you're proud of your work you want to be proud of your work you want to show your work to others to your family to your friends to 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 others right you want this proudness of your own work and 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 
uh, it makes you feel good. And you create like a piece of something big. No, so absolutely. No, no. My point was more in the direction of uh, like technical and the, like you as an artist are, are not de defining how the pipeline works or how the the look of the movie will be. You, yes. You, you create your yes. piece and your piece is part of the, of the big one and you should feel like part of this big project. That's cool. But uh, it is not your decision about like art direction or um, kind of like department uh, works yeah. and that was actually the like you're not paying for the movie you're not organizing the movie keep your your like attention and your feedback to the parts that that you are expert in and that you are part of and that's also yes. how you see it you will not like look at the movie and and like you you will say like oh the modeling is shit but the lighting is great you know because yeah. then you will feel like proud about your stuff but like you know you know like this is not my this is not my issue or the compositing was not good you say you're like you know you're proud about your stuff i mean you're proud of the whole project but you're mostly proud if something is bad you you li literally will will say oh, like the the things i i was working on were cool like my team work on cool but if some other department like fucked it up you will differentiate that for sure i'm pretty sure about it. i i because i i know that i do that too if, if like if someone else's work was like subpar uh you will say like oh i i love how we what we did in the lighting sadly i don't know the compositing could have of, been a little uh, bit better of the color grading could be better so that's a little bit the difference in in this situation i was talking specifically about like render layers and stuff like that which in some cases uh, the artist has no like it is more of a structural thing in this case probably i agree it's it's uh, maybe in terms of workflow or pipeline, artists have actually an, a good impact in it or should have um, because you want to build the structure, the, the workflow and the pipeline based on the needs of your artists, of your team, so they can be more efficient. Ultimately, you want to make them efficient so you get your product. So if they say, well, this tool we got is not really working for us or it's very user unfriendly, I um, mean, it's very difficult to, to deal with it or very annoying then this is feedback you actually want to get. So you can have a TD or a pipeline TD uh, sit on the task and say, hey, can we can we make something? Can we make it better for the team? Can we make it better for the artists? Which also stops at the moment when it, this specific moment, which I was described was kind of the the diva who was coming from, I, I, I do it this way. It stops in individualism. That's something you 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 don't yes. want to address too much because it it. It's uh, as, yes. as we talked, like with Sabine Hella, she was talking about rigging and she's like, um, you can do everything. An artist can't ask me everything. And I, as a rigger, for example, I can deliver everything. But at the end, it's a, still a project and you have you cannot deliver individual needs and individual like apps that only one person needs or uh, something like that. So and that was actually the, the whole, whole point is like, um, yes, everything that you said. Um, it stops at individualism and it stops when yeah. you when you reach out too far out of your department yes. and you, you create a disconnect because um, you're too lazy. That was the issue. You're you're lazy. You're you're comfortable in your uh, old workflows, and this is the whole the whole discussion. So if that's the point, then that's when I'm I'm saying like you're you're you you are part of this. You get paid for being here. Yes. Uh, yes, I understand. First, yeah. first and foremost, do your job. That's uh, that's uh, that's why it sounded a little bit harsh, but uh, in the context of the of the whole uh, kind of example that I gave, yeah, it makes sense. Was exactly that. But yeah. it, it's absolutely true. As a as a TD, my job is is satisfy the lighting uh, lighting lighter in this case um, as a lighting TD because like I don't have a job if he doesn't make his job uh, correct. You know, like my job is hundred percent make him happy. Of course. In a way, I want myself happy. I want to have a challenge. I want to have cool things, and I want to create things where I feel like people are appreciated of it, and it helps. I, like literally, I can see it. But my main job is at the end of the day is like he works on the light, and my job is to help him uh, make the best of it. So he feels comfortable. He spends most time on creating shot and who are pretty and like you know create a final thing anything else is not my job everything else is is ego and whatever people sometimes have uh but like a td for example role is absolutely a supporting role to uh to a specific degree until maybe you do sample your own lighting or something like that yeah and here it comes also to down to the to the hierarchy in a way that why you have actually leads in a team or supervisors who kind of try to accumulate all the information of what each individual artist would like to have in a tool or in a software 
and then you kind of filter out what is really needed or what has the most impact for everyone so that you not only address the issues of one person rather than does it have a benefit for everyone else as well. So here's also the individualism kind of stops. The other thing you mentioned about fun, which I actually regret to have not mentioned at the beginning, um, I think fun is also a very, very important um, point to have within a good team. When you build a team, you need to um, develop this feeling of not or not even develop, let's say you need to have this kind of openness and freedom to have the fun, to have the humor, to 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 choke around. So don't take everything so serious. Um, so that's that's also very important. You always want to have your work done with a laugh, not crying, being frustrated in a dark corner in the room. Initiate f fun, if you can say it, or or create the atmosphere and the environment to have this. How much is that your responsibility? If you have a very good team, well-oiled team, which can work very well together, usually they have this self-dynamic um, where on their own, they have a very good team spirit. They have fun with each other. They joke around. Um, they go out. They, they go party. They, they kind of more like friends with each other rather than just colleagues. I would say as a supervisor, you don't need to interfere too much. It's more than the, the point of, okay, you don't want to somehow interfere that you take it out the fun. You don't want to take out the fun as long as... So, so you're basically the, the more you, you're, you have to limit yourself than act actively. Like you, you, you shouldn't not... be the stopper. You, you shouldn't be the stopper of fun because of your, I don't know, your expectation for the team or coming like, you know, like a bulldozer into the whole thing. Yes. And like, mm -hmm. I expect that and you create already this environment. So you basically see it from a different way around. It's not your actively things, but you are more on the, you should not sabotage the, the possibility that the group dynamic creates something like that. You should definitely not sabotage it. Um, you should interfere when you see it becomes um, unproductive so that the efficiency um, suffers on that because of, okay, they're not taking their job serious anymore. That then becomes a problem where you actually actively have to interfere. Um, but what I mean is that you um, not try to lower it. Um, if someone makes, I don't know, half an hour longer lunch break because they have a very good talk uh, about a fun topic, about a movie or about something, then okay, let them talk half an hour, hour longer, right? Usually artists are very responsible people in my opinion. And if they take half an hour longer for lunch, they often stay anyway longer in the evening to, to finish their work or do their work, right? But when I think you should try actively to inspire the team, like to be more free, um, to feel more comfortable, um, is when you really get the opposite feeling, right? The team does not actually have fun. They don't want to be here. They feel uncomfortable in, in sitting there and doing their tasks. So here as a as a lead or as a supervisor, I think you are responsible for actively having to, like trying to change that. You want to create this, this feeling in your team that everything, everyone can be free. Everyone, if I want to make a joke, okay, make a joke. If, if I have to be afraid of, okay, what, okay, I cannot say this because he will hate me. Um, you know, you, you kind of want to create this atmosphere of, of, of openness in a way, of friendshipness, right? I think the perfect places where uh, supervisors, leads, producers, the, the artists, basically the whole team can be very open and honest with each other. I think that that automatically creates this feeling of, okay, we actually have fun at work. We can be, we can make jokes, we can laugh. Um, no one gets annoyed by, by that in a way. Um, yeah. So that's for me also a very important point to have fun at work. Very important. You spend most of your time at the working place and you rather want to laugh than to cry. We circle back to the original question of the feedback. I think that's a perfect uh, segue to that because uh, that's the point where you said you don't want to sabotage fun, but you start to sabotage fun or potentially if you give someone feedback. That's uh, especially yes. like... Uh, like professional feedback. We're not talking yes. about the second one about like your personal feedback about like what's going on with you and whatever, but like, let's say a lighting feedback, uh, yeah. everyone has a, has their own, like, you know, if you are feel a part of it, you feel responsible for your shot. You feel you're capable of doing that. And now you spoil the fun by giving feedback. 
basically or potentially. So how do you approach that without spoiling the fun and still uh, like getting to the point? Yes. Yeah, so um, professional feedback. Okay. Um, so I first explain of how it actually how I did it, uh, how and how I ideally would like to do it. So what what happened um, during the duration as a super when I was a supervisor is that I have kind of we have this review room. Um, I think most studios have it. We kind of darken everything down. You have your screens, uh, color calibrated. Everything is set up, and there where you watch kind of the work from your artists, what, whatever the work can be, right? In this case, lighting. So you watch if how the the lighting works within the shot. You compare it. What is what art direction wants? What the director wants? So you can have light briefs. How does the continuity work with the within the sequence with the other surrounding shots? Um, and is the mood like the emotion that the image creates, is that actually working fine? Is that what we want? That's more from the artistic point of view. And then on top of that, you have also the kind of the review from a technical point of view where you see obvious mistakes. Um, I can see a masking error or um, the light is 180 degree um, wrong positioned uh, or uh, the character part, the character in the backgrounds are missing. So you have kind of this, the obvious mistakes uh, which are kind of a list of okay, that's that's just wrong in within the shot because maybe it's missing from layout, maybe the animation is the wrong version. It can be it can be anything almost at that point, um, and the artistic. So how do you, yeah, communicate that with the artists? So what I usually do with with the production team that I have my team within the review room and we look at the at the image at the at the shot and then I would comment on what I think should be adjusted or changed or tweaked on that shot level like from a technical as well as from an artistic point of view or if, if it's error so technical not so much I will I not open shots and look for technical errors like the AOV is missing or render layer is missing so that I, I don't do um, but more from from the artistic side okay the rim light is maybe wrong position or the key light has um is too too intense or it's burning out we're losing um color information the background is missing depth so can we kind of create some additional fill lights for example um to emphasize certain areas in the background more um where, where maybe it's important for the story so what happens here is i usually make a list with with so with the team so the production team is usually behind me and they're writing down with what what i i try to communicate and they kind of make bullet points in a way where they write down, okay, please change this, change this, adjust this, adjust that. So it kind of becomes a list of tasks which the artist and can go through and then adjust. Um, what we figured out in a production where time matters a lot, so very tight schedule, if you create this bullet point feedback, it's actually the most effective ones. Um, because the artist, what the artist in this case can do is he literally goes one point after the other and it only makes that adjustment, but does not need to look at anything else anymore. He really only needs to look like he or sorry, I, I mean he or she, the artist, and only needs to, to look at the individual point and then adjust that. And you submit it again. And usually that works very efficient. Um, it can be that maybe the artist forgot the point or didn't understand certain uh, instructions or bullet points, and then you, you have another retake or another iteration. So that works kind of efficient. But if you want to go into more detail, so that would be now the case where I, what I would like to do, but usually don't have the time to, is that I then say, okay, let's call the artist into the review room, have him sit um, next to us, and we go through this point. So I can actually explain the person of why this is wrong or why this could be different or could be better or why this should be tweaked. So the artist understands the reasoning behind it and also learns more throughout the process. So that would be the, the perfect case for me. But then again, it's very time consuming. And um, that's basically the downside. It's very time, time consuming and sometimes you don't have that, unfortunately. Basically, your approach is generally speaking also like time wise also is to break it down to a very technical level, you know, Bullet points. I mean, from 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 a programming standpoint, is always this, 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 this is broken, or this, 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 this feature is still missing, and then like someone just looks at the list and just like, uh, kind of like look, 
check, look, check, basically. So you, you break it down to be a little bit more of a like scientific approach, a little bit more of a to-do list, basically approach. A, Instead yes. of like having like like a long-winded sentence or something like that, you try to to break it down to really like uh, missing rim on the left side. Yeah. Right. Color is to yellow, ba 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 bam, and then basically the artist is basically just the executor of the of the list, basically more or less at the end of the day. Yes, correct. So kind of a to do list. To do list. That's the probably the perfect term for it. Perfect expression, um, where you really go point by point, and you you don't need to think a lot about it. So, but as I said, that's while it's very efficient, I don't find this very inspiring. Neither as an artist nor as a as a supervisor. Yes, it gets the work done, and the artist kind of has also the feeling, okay, I'm I'm faster getting the shot done. But personally, I would not have this fulfilled feeling behind it that I actually understand, okay, why did I now have to change that? I like the idea, generally speaking, also like the the way you see it as a as a like to do list that you just uh, work because at the end of the day. Um, the creative work is more or less done because he is on a, on a level that he wants to present it. And yeah. uh, like after like the initial weeks and months, uh, people know what to do and what's expected. So they more or less hit it with a lot of accuracy. Um, and, and there you just say from a supervisor perspective, from a whole film perspective or whatever perspective in this case, just say what, what is technically, like creatively technically, combined um not correct for the whole film or for something that you would expect from the specific level yes and i feel i like that because at the end of the day the creative part is done already because you lighted the scene and you just kind of criticize only the parts that will not match with the next shot or will not match yeah. with the actual mood kind of so kind of, I, yes. I kind of like this this separation and i'm pretty sure as you mentioned if it's a super important shot like money shot for example i'm pretty sure that's more of on the on the side of this should be a personal discussion probably yes you're absolutely right so you have this these key shots this money shots as you just said um which definitely need more time and you want to spend more time on them because often it happens there's um, you have a lot of ref like you use them as a reference shot for all other follow up shots or shots next to each. So you want to spend more time on that one and then um, already have the changes or the adjustments already taken care of in the next in the future shots in a way. So that for sure. But as I mentioned before, personally for me it would be more ideal if you can actually always communicate with the artist um, next to it. I think it's a more fulfilling. Um, approach in a way that um, you can explain why certain changes are needed and the artist understands the background of it so why do you want to I don't know change the key light a bit more to the right so you get the shadow line maybe adjusted um, so you you kind of give a definition an explanation of why you do certain points um, so that's important and where I think it becomes a struggle, so I experience it as well as an artist, is when you get this feedback where, where it becomes experimental. So in a way of, okay, is this something we are trying or is this actually a change? Because as an artist, I often got frustrated when you kind of, uh, when it says, yeah, push it a bit more to the right, you push it a bit more to the right. No, push it even more to the right. And then you say, no, actually, it's not working. Let's go back to the left. And then you kind of go back and forth, back and forth. And you're kind of slowly trying to get closer and closer. So in this case, it feels like, OK, that the defined direction is missing. Um, maybe the vision is missing, or the art director is not sure of what it should be, or it has not the right feeling that it actually works. So in this case, you become more experimental. I fully understand that. So often you have something in your mind and then you recreate it in, in, in 3D and then it's absolutely not working. So you have to change it, right? And what I do in this case, I usually let the artist know that from this point um, it's a hit or miss. So it can be working or not, but we're trying something out. In this case, the artist understands, okay, this is something maybe we have to go back to a previous version or something else. It's just the knowledge about it rather than not having to do it. So you will still do it no matter what. But at least you know, okay, we are now in an in a in an area where we experiment. And in this case, it gives the artist also the understanding 
um, behind it and the less frustration. And also artists then often feel like more, mm, more in integrated, I would say, or more and more like that, okay, actually now I can show, maybe I find something which the supervisor likes. Especially if you explain the, let them what you actually want from that, you know, like I want to give exactly. the rim light to exactly. separate from the background or something like that. And then maybe he finds a solution without the rim light or, or like a second solution where he did something with the background or something. And like I think that. this is for me a very important point to communicate to the artist as well. So in, in the professional feedback, it doesn't matter if it's a bullet point that you write it down and you actually can write it down. Hey, this is, this is an, a try. This is an experimental, um, tweak we want to, to do and see if it's working out or if you talk to, to a person and say hey or for example after the review you can talk to go to the artist and say yeah maybe here be careful and then you can go more into details and explain it i feel this is like a, a great point i think this experimental thing should be addressed uh like more often because i sometimes feel it's uh it's maybe a hiding thing it's maybe uh you are so not sure that it is experimental sometimes you find out later that it you thought it will work. You didn't know that it will, it will actually end up being a uh, seven reviews just to figure out which color uh, the back background will have be or something like that. But I feel like um, this could be addressed more often, by because especially I mean if you know it beforehand, because because at the end of the day it is as what as you mentioned it is it creates a lot of frustration if you if you do reviews and and you're like you feel like you know what you're doing and then it's like it's not correct and you're like okay the light to the left okay the background is dark and you're like i feel like i'm doing it correct why are you kind of giving me like giving me this thing back and and this creates this like the small comment sometimes just of like uh i'm not 100 percent sure i'm trying to experiment can help and of course the, the bigger comment of i'm i'm trying to experiment and that is what to want to achieve if you have ideas uh, please, please let me know. But I think we should go this direction. Helps a lot, I think, in this Absolutely case. Absolutely correct. I think here it's really uh, to the point of how, how, how do you communicate it, that the person knows what is expected. And that's going back to the topics we discussed before. It's more like you know what to do. And, and it doesn't matter if it's supervisor, art director, client director. Um, everyone is, we are just all human beings. And um, it's a creative industry. Everything is is very subjective in a way. So yeah, as a supervisor or anyone who makes a decision on the final image, you can make mistakes. It can look bad after something you asked for. And yes, you want to go back, but to keep the team also um, like motivated in a way, not, not that the frustration comes up, you want to communicate it. They will, I, the experience I made so far is they are fully on side, they're fully on your, your with you. They want to make it better and they understand if something does not work, we want to change it. Most of the time they know it themselves, you know, most of the time they they also see like, ah, uh, it yes, doesn't work, exactly, but I did exactly. it because he asked me to. Uh, yeah. So let's see how the review will go, basically. I actually like the, the difference uh, between the technical and the more kind of like meta uh, review because i feel like you do the the big one hopefully with everyone that's the best case you do the big one with everyone maybe everyone has a kind of a key shot so you explain them what you want and then it's basically just uh, the the technical parts basically for all the other shots it's just like you didn't deliver on that discussion maybe i i didn't explain myself now but i explain now through my like bullet points or um, you didn't understand, but and now you will understand through my bullet points, hopefully, Not, like I would say in most cases. So I like this kind of um, binary situation where you, uh, best case, you have this discussion with the artist so he knows exactly what's going on in the shot and what is expected. And then you just go into the do your thing, do what is expected in your own kind of creativity. But when, when I give you feedback, it means you like, from your point of view, you shifted away from what the expectation and you just have to correct them. And I think uh, I, I like this thing because it creates this kind of, I'm free until the supervisor tells me otherwise, basically, or the one who gives me the review. And it do doesn't become a, a permanent discussion about every shot. You don't have to uh, explain why it has to be 10% brighter and 7% uh, yellower or something like that. It's like, I explain it to you, best case. 
and now uh, the only bullet points I give you is basically referring back to the original explanation, more or less, uh, in most cases. So I, I like this kind of thing because it makes everything a little bit more, this is time for discussion, this is time for action, you know? So I feel like um, it, it, it also gets away from this individualism and stuff like that, because sometimes I, I remember I, I did the same thing and I like sometimes just to do the things, you know, if someone just, if you would tell me the rim light is too soft, I just like, I just look at the comment and I just do it. Exactly. Like, I will it, not it, argue kind of about you out, this ridiculous small parts, you know? It it depends also on the artist, right? So um, I think in a, in a tight schedule, this is the most efficient way how you want to move forward. Um, but it's, as I mentioned, not very fulfilling from an artist's point of view, can be not very fulfilling. But a lot of artists actually also appreciate it because it it kind of makes them more smooth, more easier to do their job in a way. But it, it really depends on what direction you want to go. If you want to learn and to develop further, you maybe want to understand why you do certain changes. I mean, again, it, it comes back to you have to be as basically what you said in the beginning, but now in, in the smaller cases, like you have to be very clear about the expectation. Like at the beginning, you set expectation of the artist, but now in this case, you are uh, clear about the expectation of this uh, sequence, maybe. So the bullet points that come back are just just uh, the like execution of the expectations, like. Yeah, you, you didn't fulfill the expectation for whatever reasons, and I tell you which one you didn't fulfill. So just do them. And so for me, it's like as long as you have this uh, this clear communication of um, the artist knows what more or less what he has to do. He has his, his creative environment, well, how, how he could do it, and then you just go to okay, great job, but that 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 that. Uh, is away from that. And if they're too far away, then you can open again like the uh, the discussion and Correct. say like, hey, I, I feel Correct. like we have a misunderstanding. We maybe yeah. have to uh, make clear that this is like a dark, moody environment and not happy, happy uh, wonderland. Um, so I feel like th that's why I like this, this, this thing of discussion open, but then it's just realizing it. And it's not, there's not much to discuss about like this kind of Technic, artistic technical details. As but I here it's important, as, as you just said, that okay, if an artist doesn't understand it, for example, or they, does it get it wrong, or is not sure about the note, like the bullet point that person just got, um, that that artist always has the possibility to go to the supervisor or to whoever reviews and asks, okay, I didn't understand that. Can you please um, explain it to me? So that should be always the possibility. Um, to to maintain, I think in my case as well, um, to maintain the, the team structure, like the team spirit. We are all working together, and um, maybe yes, I'm I'm your supervisor, but in the end, I see myself more like I'm here to help you do your job because you are you are actually doing the shot which will end up on on the on in the movie, right? Which will be in the cinema. You will you are doing the work itself, so. So my position or my function as a supervisor in this case would be um, to be a, let's say, like a servant to, to the artist. So what, how can I help you that you can be more efficient, that you can do your job the best possible way? And I see that almost on any um, leadership function, like is it is it from from a production manager or producer or um, other supervisors, department supervisors? Like I feel like we are all exist. To, to to help the artists who are actually doing the work so they can do the work better and faster. Sometimes uh, see it's like as an architecture, you you know the building and uh, the the lighters, the engineers who built the building actually. So you will you will not you are not the one who creates the shot at the end of the day, but you plan the shot and you know the, the all the doors and stuff. And you also again, it's always this kind of the discussion of you have more overview. That's the that's the that's the benefit of being an artist or like a technical person. Uh, um, you are just focusing on one task. For you, this task is the world. This shot is the world. You want to make it the best. Of course, there's like some guidelines, but this is your world. Um, but you cannot see after that. It doesn't, you, you, you cannot see how much it matches to the whole movie. I mean, sometimes I had a situation where you, you cannot have the quality as you try to do because you cannot maintain it for the whole movie. So you have to really dump down the quality because uh, it will not make sense if a sequence or a shot looks like amazing, like really like Pixar quality, and the rest of the movie looks like a play blast from Maya.
And uh, so there's this kind of, uh, yeah, that, that's where, where your individual like opinion is, needs to be kind of adjusted to the whole film, which is the, is with part of the, of the review, basically. We did an, a feedback discussion after I left and I really, really uh, appreciate that. It was one of the first maybe, or the second, or, but definitely one of the rare occasions that I ever had a personal feedback discussion to me, like as I am in the company, you know, like in my work, but also as a like as someone who's like working in the team, basically. So what I'm I'm wondering is like on one side, how often do you think it's important to have this kind of discussion, and what is the the, the purpose for you? What do you want from that? Like not specifically for the end, let's say for generally, like if you do a typical once a month, once a year, or whatever a discussion, what do you want from that one? Yes, personal reviews. I think very important topic. Um, good that you mention it. I think it's part of having a team. Um, is is the feedback you the personal feedback you give a person. So what does what does it mean? Like, uh, not every studio does it. I'm not sure how many studios actually do it. Um, I remember it from from double negative time, and I really liked it and tried to adapt it as well um, when I was a supervisor. Um, that there I had once a year the, the so-called annual review where they kind of uh, talk with you in a, like in a one-to-one -one meeting about your achievements over the year, about your work and about the feedback you collected throughout all the different projects you worked on. So you, you got feedback from supervisors, from leads, maybe from people working next to you within the same room or basically just very... I would not say random, but feedback from a lot of people. Um, so you collect it and then based on that, you give a personal feedback to this person. So the person knows, the artist knows where to improve or um, what was not so good or what is actually very good or where, where did they do an amazing job, for example, right? Um, so what I try to do in my time as a supervisor is um, whenever the project finished, I tried to to do a review, like a personal feedback review in a way. Like a post-mortem, basically. You could say, yeah, I could say a post-mortem meeting um, with this person. So a one-to-one -one meeting on a, on a, let's say on a per personal level. So it's not about being professional in a way, right? Um, you, you, of course, you're professional, um, but you really talk about that individual person on its own and how I experienced to work with that person over the time or the duration of the project. So I usually do it after the project or when a person is leaving during the project. So when he's leaving the company, then I usually also do that. Um, for me, the important point is here more to give feedback to the person. So, so the, the artist can learn from it. So what, what I found good, um, what I found maybe not so good or what could have been improved, um, how do I evaluate the work or the the teamwork with this person? So kind of going really into detail or even examples if you have, but explaining the person what I liked and what I didn't like. So in the in the hopes of that that person can um, learn from it, if as it's personal in a way and professional, the person can take this feedback as as he wants to. Um, accept it or don't accept it but ultimately you have information you can do something with it if you do great if you don't also fine it's really up to you if you want to change certain things if you want to improve or or whatever right maybe everything was perfect and and sometimes i, I could just say please stay as you are you're an amazing individual being you're amazing to work with i love to work with you i hope we can work again together in the in the near future right so so that would be then where you maybe don't have a lot of feedback, but it makes that person very happy as well. You want to hear kind of the things. Also, if you do something wrong, you want to hear if you do something wrong. You want to know, yeah, did I do a good job? Was it fine? I have no idea, right? So that's the goal for me. And also, I think a way of showing respect to, to that artist. So yes, maybe you are an artist of many others, but they still see you as a human being and you deserve to know how you did.
Is there like a technique that you use when you approach that, or like a sandwich technique? Uh, you talked about that one positive, one negative, one positive, or something like that, or you just go into that? Because I know I feel like because I remember our discussion and uh, from you, from how I know you as a person, I feel like you are more on the positive side, generally speaking. You even if probably someone is a little bit more on the on the edge of I, I'm I have to really. Sc- like stretch to find all the positives here but uh i feel like you're always trying to come from this side more than than just just kind of like like say like oh you, you could be more on time or um you could argue less on this on, on a on a review or whatever kind of situation i feel like you come from that is there like something like a approach that you go through that specifically the approach i do here is basically um before i have this meeting with the person i I take my notes, I take my time to really think throughout the production of how we work together, how you work within the team. But as you said, I think more from, I try at least to think more from a positive side. So so no matter how, let's say, unmotivated a person is, usually you always find ways, or not ways, you always have points which are actually good. Um, even if a person doesn't fit into the team or doesn't fit into the job, right? Um, it can have various reasons, which is why I find the communication so important to understand um, the person, why you maybe don't fit into the team or maybe or maybe why you're not good in doing that task, right? And then the feedback, I go then more into the detail of, okay, what I liked. So why, why let's say, let's take the, the, the lighting artist, like the department, right, for lighters. I had artists which were absolutely not lighters. They didn't want to be lighter, but we hired them as a lighters. And uh, if you don't want to actually do the job or you don't feel like this is your the subject you want to, to work with, then um, obviously you will most likely not do a good job, right? So, and in here, it's more than the talk develops more in a direction of, Let's think about, is this really the right direction you want to go? So it doesn't have to be only saying this you did good or this you did bad, but maybe to figure out, is this actually, is the lighting position for you, for example, really the thing you want to do or is it not? Maybe you want to be a surfacing artist, right? Because you really like the look dev part. So, so in this case, yes, I know, for example, that person then left the company, um, started the next one as a, as a shading surfacing artist texture artist and did an amazing job. So so it's it's really right to figure out what is the best approach. So it's not only about what you did good and what did you bad, right? So it's it's kind of all of it. But yes, usually I start with a, a, a list of positive things I value very much as a person, as an individual, as a professional, and then try to show the points which I, like from my perspective, which I would suggest maybe here you can work on or maybe that you can improve or maybe this is something where you don't want to do it again in the future so it's basically also a little bit of a career kind of discussion where you maybe say like you could be a lead like you know if you push a little bit in this direction you could be a lead or uh you're just not a good lighter maybe you should start surfacing or something um Okay, that's, I think that's that's super important because uh, that's something I also experienced, for example, at Weta uh, a little bit um, more on the professional level, less on the career level to be, um, but this kind of discussion of like, how do you do uh, as a, like, for example, if, if you get your own project, for example, in terms of, for example, programming as a technical director on Pipeline, you get your, you make your apps and then they give you a feedback. Uh, you were the main person on that. You had two people who supported you. How did it work out? You know, are you capable of being someone who is in charge of the of the main part? And so it's kind of a, a feedback, also um, a little bit career wise in a way. Even on this level, it's kind of like how would it would it be if you would be promoted, for example, or if you would become independent in some ca- capacities? You know, you could decide for yourself how like the light will be or something like that. Um, this is something I I noticed. For example, on that one. Yes, yeah, so 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 definitely, I would. I I'm treating it this way. So every every talk is very different, um, and in addition to that, so to the personal feedback, let's say to the individual artist, uh, what I often also um, talk about in these meetings 
is um, the other way around. So how did the artist experience the production? How did the artist experience um, the team? How did you feel within the company working on this project, having these people as a supervisor, having working within the team? So how what was the experience of the person? So it's also very valuable to get the, to know how did the artist feel, right? So what did the artist like? What did he not like, for example? And then from a company point of view or from a team point of view, supervisor point of view, you maybe want to do adjustments based on that because you go, ah, I never saw it from this perspective. And now you get more information um, where you can do certain adjustments to make maybe improvements on the next project, on the next team you want to build. To kind of summarize uh, the whole discussion was um, that building a team starts already by in the recruiting. It get, like Sometimes you have no choice. You, you already have a team uh, from a project and you can, it doesn't really start at recruiting, but in general, it can start at recruiting. It starts at interviews. We talked a little bit of like the purpose of an interview is actually less the skill part, but more the team part, actually. How is that? How will the person integrate? Integrate? Yeah, that's how I, I think most see it. Like there's rare occasion where you have like a technical interview. But uh, generally, technical uh, an interview is more on this focus, and then that you need a time, like a ramp up time, is called it, um, to really get people going. Not even like even if the project is going and this new person coming in, or the project starts from fresh, there needs to be kind of like a project for each for everyone who's coming in. He can handle in a way that uh, like you know it, it's not a too high expectation. It is close to what we're doing, but it's still something like baby steps uh, wise. And then also how to, in a way, maintain the whole relationship with, uh, as we talked about fun, for example, you don't be, don't be the Judas of the fun in, in the end of the day, just, just like, don't, don't be the blocker at first. I think that's the, the, the first part is, you know, you, you have your responsibilities as someone who, who is, who is responsible for the team. You have to push it forward. You have your deadlines and so on. And that's where you have to kind of poke the bear a little bit of the team, um, but try not to do it in a way that, that spoils the fun. So I think that's a good thing because it's it's not very responsibility to create the fun. I mean, you can see it a little bit as a side, side quest if you want to, but um, I think it's more of a responsibility don't to destroy the, the kind of the dynamic of the team in itself. It's also important here to mention what, how do you define fun in a way. So I'm not I'm not necessarily only saying, yeah, we are all constantly laughing and telling us jokes and and um, we are having the party of, of our lifetime. It's it's more in a way of, do you have fun doing your work as well, right? Do you like your work? Do you, you enjoy it? So it's part of that. Which comes also with inspiration and you can break the inspiration if, with deadlines, for example. You know, if you only feel like you just catching up the next deadline, you lose the feeling of you're creating something, you know, if there, there's this kind of, there where it can be. And then of course, the la last part was like reviews, you know, reviews of the work, professional reviews, which I really like this. I I, re I love this concept actually. Uh, it's it's in a way obvious, but in a way as also uh, makes make more clear for me to differentiate between the creative part, the discussion part, the a clear, make it clear part, and that break it down and just follow the what we talked about part to, like again, the real realistic of a production. You know, you don't have the time to be like make a twenty minute discussion with each artist on each shot um, thing. And it's also in a way for the artist much easier to digest because he knows what's going on generally, and now he gets it in a very digestible uh, list way. And then finally, to come back to the like review of the person itself, you know, giving a little bit of appreciation, which I, which this is what what I experienced, for example, when we had to talk that uh, I experienced like some kind of a generally that we did that was just, was already kind of a sign of appreciation. Um, and then of course the whole talk is was kind of felt like um, what I could do and just getting feedback because sometimes you're depends on the environment. You sometimes absolutely not clear how you move through the team, you know, how are you perceived? Uh, you know, are you maybe someone who's always punching your way forward or are you someone who's super passive or you're someone the, that doesn't deliver, you feel like always like you're always behind or something. And this kind of can help up like open miss 
miscommunications, misinterpretations, um, and open up like, you know what, um, uh, you are amazing in this and that. And sometimes people are like, what? Oh, I didn't notice that I'm the fun of the room, for example, or I am the the one who motivates every time uh, everyone gets down because it's the deadline was moved forward again or something like that. So this kind of small sentence sometimes can make a huge difference on someone's fun and also kind of like continuation. Very much, very much. So also also because you're summarizing, the communication for me is really the the way to go here. Um, even if you're in a very tight production, like with a tight schedule, if you have five minutes to spare for an artist, take these five minutes. It will it will help you hours later on. I think that was we we mostly speak about how to approach that from the building side, and that was also the idea of. The, I always think it is you are as responsible from the artist side. So to kind of close it up of the whole topic, I would be curious: is like, is there something that you feel an artist or the everyone in the team can do something to keep this momentum of the team, this dynamic. Yeah, I would say um, be open, be always open to others. We are all creative people. We are artists. We work with passion. So we are one of these few industries in the world which um, gets very much defined by the individual passion of each person um, and respect that. So you have a lot of different characters. Um, let's say most artists are very nerdy or geeky in a way, which personally I love. Um, but everyone has the individualistic strengths and weaknesses. And as a team, you you kind of want to be open to everything. If a person needs space, give that person space. But always be open and try to integrate people. So what experience in some companies you join and you're kind of kind of left alone. Um, it usually the first days or weeks are very hard to get to know people. So in here, uh, I would like to recommend as a team. So here it's more like the team itself. Um, if someone new joins, um, welcome that person. Try to make it easy. Take remember them for how lunch you, or for exactly, something like that. Exactly. Remember how when you joined and how you felt on your first days. How how would you? How will you feel different if you if you just say hello to the person, right? Or or just go with the person for lunch or, or invite it to the group, whatever it is, just to break the ice, basically. I think I would add uh, a point. I mean, absolutely agree. I think that's a fantastic point. And especially the integration part, I think, is the one that builds the team because people come into that and if they are alienated, um, it's not very pleasant and it creates also this disconnect very fast. I think what I would add is like, don't take yourself too serious. Uh, in in general, like as as a person and also not as an artist, it's just like uh, you're not the the pinnacle of the world. Your work is maybe not the most important in the in the company. Who knows? But uh, just take it as it is. If someone gives you feedback, uh, uh, then it gives you feedback. And um, I don't know. So I think that's something important. And if you struggle with something, uh, I think also just recollect: is it is that is that something is it something personal? And then maybe you should address it with, with your friends and stuff like that. You know, like you just have a problem with how you communicate or something, or it's something very, very specific to the project or to the to the team or uh, to the supervisor. And then you should address them with them. I think it's also important to to don't bring too much baggage into the, the, the thing. It's, it's, it's always the same thing because sometimes you bring it. And it's 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 not good. It's there's like an element where where suddenly people are involved in in people's bad moods, you know, and it's a, and it's something where it can reach a point of like, okay, this is like, keep it at home a little bit. It's like to some degree again. Um, and I think that's something that comes back to don't take yourself too serious a little bit also. You're part of the team, right? So you, you're equally valued as everyone else. It doesn't matter in a way what position. Um, if you're part of a team, you have a certain responsibility. There are certain expectations to you and try to fulfill them in, in the best way you can. And always challenge yourself, try to develop further and work together. So I think we're in this perfect industry where you have to work together to actually succeed. That's it with this week's episode of the 21 Artist Show. Thank you so much for watching and listening. 
This podcast is 100% ad-free. And to keep it that way, check out my website, 21artistshow.com. There you can find exclusive access to awesome masterclasses and coaching opportunities to work successfully in visual effects, animation, and games. Just go to 21artistshow.com. And don't forget to share it with people who would benefit from that content and tell them they're awesome. See you on the next episode. Next on the 21 Artist Show. Most of our employees have my cell phone number. And if they really feel like it, or if they have a question, or if they feel unheard, or if they don't want to say something in a, in a bigger meeting where everybody's present, then they can really pick up the phone and give me a call. And I would really like to keep running the place that way.